Joining us on the line right now is Pat Buchanan, who is also the author of a book right now called The Greatest Comeback, How Richard Nixon Rose from the Dead to Create America's New Majority. Uh, Mr. Buchanan, it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Good to talk with you again, Brian. Well, we want to we want to turn to the issue with you this morning of immigration. And let me just read a story, uh, in, in case you're not familiar with it, from the New York Times that suggests that the Obama administration is now considering whether to allow minors and young people from Honduras into the U.S. without having to make that dangerous trek through Mexico. Apparently, the administration is considering whether or not they should send officials down to screen the young people and to allow them passage to the United States based on humanitarian uh, concerns. And they are going to do this, wait for it, sir, wait for it, Mm -hmm. through executive action. Your thoughts? The executive action sounds familiar, but I think what the uh, president, uh, if this is what he's contemplating, you will have an enormous flood of individuals, teenagers and others, headed straight to the American consulate in uh, Honduras and applying for refugee status and heading straight to the United States of America. I think this raises the whole question of... uh, how many people can the United States take in legally and illegally from all over the world if everywhere we decide there's something of a repressive government or individuals feel repressed or deeply impoverished, they have a right to come to the United States? What about this idea that, that you know, he's once again using his, to use his words, pen and phone to go around Congress? I mean, he repeatedly says that he wants to get something done on immigration reform, and yet here we are now with the president cutting out the middleman here, which is Mexico, not telling the governments of, of Honduras or other countries that they need to tell their people to stop breaking our laws, and now instead is trying to redefine refugee status without the consent of Congress. Well, I think it's uh, the, there's going to be a firestorm over this, because uh, you're right. This is exactly what the president has said he would do. He's got his, uh, his pen in hand, and he's got his telephone, and uh, since Congress won't act, he will act independently and alone and basically go outside the law or rewrite the law or reinterpret the law to impose his policies on the country. I think he's got a tremendously hostile and inflamed Congress. I think this issue, Katie, is a blazing issue now with the entire American electorate. I think you're going to see Congress resist it. And I think you're going to see this increasingly put on the agenda, this along with uh, Obama's uh, assertions of executive power on the agenda for this coming November and for 2016 as well. Uh, Speaker of the House John Boehner has uh, sent the president something of an ultimatum. He says, basically, if you don't change the 2008 human trafficking law, we're not going to give you any money to help deal with this border crisis. Is that a dangerous position for Republicans to take? I don't think it really is. I think the the Republicans simply do not trust the president and... uh, and they do not know that the president will follow through if they pass something. And secondly, they don't think uh, the president's law is going to do what, he, what it, 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 intended to, it intends to accomplish. I think what the Republicans have basically decided is if we throw down the gauntlet on this issue, we can win this battle. And we can explain this to the American people as we could not explain some other times what we were doing. But this one they understand. So I think it's an assertion of Republican strength. Uh, for a change. Do you think that they'll actually follow through, though, or do you think that we'll just be in the standstill holding pattern again as we've been in the past? Well, we've seen action over in the Senate with Milkowski and others to alter what the president proposed. I think on this one, I think the Congress and the Republican Party uh, and the leaders down on the border who are on fire with anger and rage and the people, I think you've got a real majority here, and I think that you could, Democrats could really push the president and say, look, we've got to compromise with the Republican position, or we really are going to take a bath in November. Well, I think, too, you have to, you know, we can't forget that this is not just Republicans who are pushing the president now on this illegal immigration exactly. crisis. It's also Democrats who are on the border, uh, and they're not necessarily up for reelection. So he does have some problems right. there. Well, he does indeed. you got Henry Cuellar down there saying, you know, the president's absent. Uh, why didn't he come to the border? But this is what you're seeing when you mention, Katie, the idea that the president, you know, sort of, uh, you know, indifferent to what the, the Republicans want or what the people want. He didn't go to the border. He's shooting pool. He doesn't really seem to give a, give a hoot what people think when he wants to do something. And I think that is increasingly, because you're getting a reaction from Democrats, increasingly damaging to his party. But he does not seem to care.
Well, in, in the meantime, we have this situation in Ukraine where the latest development is that the Russians apparently are firing artillery from Russia into Ukraine, sort of escalating the situation there, and we don't hear much from the president about that at all. Well, I think the president has decided here he is on, uh, he is on track with the thinking of the American people. The American people are divided over sanctions, on economic sanctions, whether Europeans should join us in tougher sanctions on Ukraine. But an enormous number of Americans, an enormous percentage I've seen in every poll I've looked at, do not want to get militarily involved in any way in the Ukraine, in Crimea, in Luhansk, in Donetsk. They just don't know anything about that region. They are fed up with war, inconclusive wars where our major return is kids coming home to Walter Reed or kids coming home to Dover. So I don't think the American people want any military intervention in Ukraine. But, and I'm not sure about some of these reports. They're in dispute as to whether or not the Russians are actually firing into Ukraine, because I don't think the Ukrainian government has made the charge quite as loudly as the Americans have. Yeah, I want to turn to your new book right now. Uh, you have a book signing tonight at Politics and Prose here in D.C. What time is that? That'll be uh, 7 o'clock tonight. All Brian, right, so and, uh, you, can, you can go down to Meet Pat and get your book signed. The Brian, new book and, is... Uh, Brian, it's about Richard Milhouse Nixon. Yeah, I was gonna, yes, it is. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, you say that it, it, you call it the greatest comeback, how Richard Nixon rose from the dead to create America's new majority. What, what's it all about? Well, here's the thing. I joined Richard Nixon in 1965 when he had a ruined career, two straight defeats, his party was shattered after the Goldwater defeat of 1964. It was half the size of the Democratic Party. People were saying it's, it's a dead institution. And for three years later, Richard Nixon is taking the oath of office as president. And four years after that, he wins 49 states. And the Republicans began a period of domination of the presidency for 20 of 24 years. How did it happen? What did he do? How did this uncharismatic man who was everywhere regarded as a loser come back and accomplish that, Brian, especially in that year, 1968, you know, of assassinations, of war, of civil disorder, of campus anarchy, where the Democratic Party simply exploded in the streets of Chicago? That's the story. And I was with Richard Nixon for all three years, very close to him. He had no one else for the first year. Yeah. Very close to him up through that uh, 1968 victory. It is a terrific story, and it's got lessons for the Republican Party today. I was just going to ask you that question. <laughs> yeah. What lessons does this have for the Republican well, Party today? Well, well uh, let me tell you, Katie, there's no doubt Richard Nixon, whatever you say about him, he was a fighter and he was a loyalist, and he went out and fought and bled for Barry Goldwater in 64, knowing he would be part of the defeat. He went out in 66 when I was with him and campaigned in 35 states and 80 congressional districts. Go out, do battle for your party, reach out to all sides. The Tea Party then was the gold martyr movement. At the same time, he endorsed Nelson Rockefeller, right. his old enemy. And he pulled it all together and put together a coalition that eventually, and thanks to what was happening in America and to the Democratic Party right. during Vietnam, suddenly there was an opening down the sidelines and Richard Nilhouse Nixon, who had been declared dead, was heading for the president. He knew how to take advantage of it. We'll have to leave it right there, Pat, but thank you so much for joining us. Well, always good to talk with you, Brian, and Katie, good to talk with you. All right. Again, book signing tonight. Don't At uh, Politics and Pros.